Good morning, God bless you. Uh, great to see that you're tuning in today. I pray that you really will receive something from the Word and it will be a Word in season that will help us as the body of Christ and uh, as the church, especially in the perilous days that we face. And uh, so let's just commit our time to the Lord. Father, we commit today to you, we commit this word to you, Lord. But just pray, Lord, that you would lead and guide us by your spirit, Lord, that we will be in sync and in tune with you, not with public opinion, not with the views of the few or the views of the many, but the views of you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you. Uh, today, we're going to start a very short series on uh, lawlessness and authority. Lawlessness and authority. And uh, obviously, we look around the world today and we can just see rampant lawlessness going on and uh, an abuse of authority and abuse to those who are in authority. There is almost a spirit of anarchy, uh, a lawless society where people are taking the law into their own hands and you know often we can understand why because sometimes uh, there seems to be much injustice sometimes there is a lot of injustice in society and there there I say there always has been there always has been Cain killed Abel right at the beginning Adam and Eve their first Two children, Cain and Abel, and right at the beginning, sin had come in and Cain killed Abel. There was injustice in the root of humanity through sin. But we've witnessed in recent weeks especially a sharp increase in lawlessness behaviour. Obviously, a lot of this is a reaction to uh, the injustice and the death of innocent people uh, that has kicked off or released the cap of a lot of oppressed emotions that maybe people have felt about injustice and now that cap's come off with the death of George Floyd and then there's an explosion of emotion because of everything that's been kind of kept down. But having said that, as believers, you know, where do we stand in these things? Because we're of the world, or, or we're in the world, but we're not of the world. So we're in it, but we're not of it. So we're living in this society, but our uh, DNA is not of this society. It should be different. Why? Because we're of the kingdom of God. So a lot of people are fighting for their view, for their people, for their culture, so on and so forth. But when we become Christians, our culture becomes secondary to the Word of God. We are transferred into a new kingdom, and it's the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. And his priorities and his kingdom culture outreigns and outrules our own cultures. Whether you're black, whether you're white, whether you're Indian, Asian, from the Far East, Middle East, all of our cultures are levelled out when it comes to the Kingdom of God. Because there's an identity change. And I think a lot of the problem that we're facing is a failure to see the identity change that God has taken place within our lives. Okay, And sadly, it's in the church. There's a lot of it in the church as well. You know, I've sat with many black pastors and they are only reaching out in their community in England to black people. They do not have white people in their churches. And when they evangelise, you see it on, on the street and witness it firsthand, they're not evangelising to Joe Bloggs, British white people person, whatever. And I've challenged some of the bishops from Africa and said, you know, they've said, oh, we're sending people to England, pastors to pastor England, to, to invest back into England because England sent the gospel around the world, blah, 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 blah. And I've had to say to them, yeah, but that's not the reality of what's happening. Now, it might happen in some cases, but in a large amount of cases, 
a lot of pastors are coming to the UK and whatever nationality they are, they are just reaching out to that people group. Dare I say Ghanaian, Nigerian, Malawian churches, where 99.5% of those in attendance are just of that people group. So they are pastoring cultural churches and not kingdom churches. And I even know in some Nigerian churches, people will not attend certain Nigerian churches dependent on the ancestral tribes that they come from. And if you come from a certain tribe, you will not go to a certain Nigerian church and vice versa. So you see, there's a discrimination even within all of that. Now, having said that, there are white churches which, again, are just looking and pastoring their own issues within the white community and they do not know how to pastor uh, people in the black community because they are cultural minded instead of kingdom minded. So what happens is even within the church people are fighting for their identity from the point of culture which is understandable but it's not from the point of kingdom. Paul, who was one of the most learned men in the Bible, a Jew of all Jews, and said a sinner of all sinners, said, I have become a slave to Christ. My identity has been swept away. My history is gone. I am a new creation in Christ Jesus. See, now I think we should celebrate our cultural backgrounds and some of our traditions, and I find them fascinating, but they cannot come before the principles of the kingdom of God. They cannot, and sometimes we have to yield some of our stuff that we hold on to for the good of peace. You know, uh, somebody might uh, cut me up and park in the parking bay I was going to park in and maybe I got there first and had the right. But for the sake of peace, I, sometimes I just say, do you know what? It's fine. You can have it. I don't mind. I'll just park over there because there's another one. See, we, we're in a world where we're all standing on our rights and we're trying to fight for ourselves because we do not acknowledge spiritually that Jesus said at the cross, it is finished. The complete work that I have come to do has been established and now you don't have to fight that fight because I have overcome the evil one. Amen? And so we have to share in the victory, but the enemy robs us of sharing in the victory, which is love and unity. And scripture says how pleasant and wonderful it is when the brothers dwell together in unity. So the enemy comes in and he wants to break that down. And I am not justifying any form of racism at all or any form of victimisation, okay? Uh, it, it's wrong whether, whether it's against uh, 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 sexual uh, orientation, whether it's against skin colour, whether it's against intellect, whatever it is, you know, injustice is injustice, it's wrong, okay? So, there's, we, we, because of the injustice and we're not always trusting the law, we begin to try and take things into our own hands. Hence, the righteous cause to fight for justice becomes polluted by the injustice of robbing, looting, vandalism, and so on and so forth. And the righteous cause loses its credibility by the few who come in in their carnality and use it as a vehicle to express their anger, frustration, everything else. And, you know, for a lot of people, it is distressing to see a lot of the monuments in this nation attacked. And there are some monuments that do not glorify the good of humanity. They actually are reminders of our vindictive 
how dangerous racism is, how dangerous slavery was, and all these other facts. And we could look at some of these guys and say, you know, this guy pioneered or did this, that and the other, and that was wrong. We've got to learn from that. And we need to use these things as a learning point to remember what had happened. You know, and that was something the the Israel Israelites used to do uh, well. They had monuments which would remind them of failures, but also remind them of victories. So you can't just go down ripping down every monument, because equally the modern day Jews could turn around and say, "Well, let's destroy the pyramids in Gaza because they were built through the slavery of the Jewish people." For hundreds of years. So let's destroy that. Let's bring it all down. No, let's leave it as a monument because one, they were built fantastically, but two, it stands as a reminder of the slavery and the injustice that the Israelites went through. So you have to have a, 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 a clear mindset. And in dealing with these stuff, it's very difficult because so much emotion gets involved because there is such injustice. And I am against injustice. I am against poverty. But Jesus said, the poor you will always have with you. You will not eradicate poverty. Why? Because humanity is greedy. So you'll never eradicate poverty. And Jesus said it. So we have to learn how to deal with these things wisely, sensibly, and with a lot of love. And there's a lot of uh, Christians that I see on Facebook, they're all just all fighting their own fight now. And there's infighting within the church over culture. And I think, man alive, you are being deceived. You are being deceived by the enemy. You are getting your identity through your skin colour when Jesus has given you a new identity as a child of God. Amen. When we get to heaven, there will not be any white power, black power, uh, anything like that. When we get to heaven, we're going to have a new body. That body might be red. That body might be green. That body might be whatever God decides it to be. The wonderful thing is we know that there will be no racism. Hallelujah. So we've just got to be careful that you don't lose your identity in fighting what's going on. Okay? We've got to make sure we still walk correctly and we walk in love. And we come to a tables of influence. The definition of lawlessness is a state of disorder due to a disregard of the law. So a state of disorder. So Lawlessness brings disorder, it brings chaos, it brings anarchy, and it brings danger. It breaks down society, it brings mistrust, and it destroys people groups. Let's turn to the scripture. Second Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 8. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 8, uh, verse 7 and 8, verse 7 and 8. And it says, For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who holds it back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way. And when the lawless one which is believed to be the Antichrist, will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendour of his coming. Okay, so scripture is teaching here that the secret power of lawlessness is already at work. So the root of lawlessness comes from a secret power. Okay, lawlessness comes from the enemy, God creating Adam and Eve in a perfect state, and then Satan come in with a lawless uh, view, polluted Adam and Eve, causing them to break the law of God. Okay, that's what happened. And this secret power of lawlessness is at work in society. 
And it's a secret power because people don't really see it as Satan or the enemy. They just see it as humanity, race and colour. But the root of this secret lawlessness power is a demonic influence in society. Now the one who holds it back will continue to do so until he is taken out of the way. Here we're talking about the Holy Spirit. At the moment, lawlessness is restrained. Okay? It's not at its forefront. It's not at its most powerful. powerful. Why? Because lawlessness is being constrained, restrained by the power of the Holy Spirit in the lives of the church and the believers. But when this power is taken away, hence the rapture of the church, then the lawless one will be revealed, who is Antichrist himself. So the Antichrist will be revealed once the Holy Spirit is removed. But then there's no battle as such. It says he will be destroyed by the breath and by the splendour of Jesus' coming. Just the appearance of Jesus, that's it. That's the end of the Antichrist. It's game over. There's not a battle. Why? Because Jesus has already defeated the enemy. The simple return of Jesus Christ is the end of all anarchy. And when you see that spirit of Antichrist, you see the lawlessness, you see the anarchy, you see the hatred. Equally, you see the causes of it, the racism, the abuse, the downtrodden, the misuse of justice. And you can see, where do these things come from? Well, they're birthed in the heart of Satan. So, we have got to be wise and we've got to stop fighting all the time for our own rights and fight for unity. We don't have to see eye to eye to walk hand in hand in the kingdom of God. We don't have to see eye to eye. Me and my wife do not see eye to eye on everything, but we walk hand in hand. Me and my children do not see eye to eye on everything. We have different points of view, but we walk hand in hand. Because our love for one another causes us to respect, even though we may disagree. We respect. And that comes from what? From love. From love. Love is the table of which we people need to have their negotiations. From love. We dealt with this the other week. You can look it up if you want. The Amplified uh, Translation translate. So lawlessness as sin or rebellion against constituted authority. Okay, so these things come in and they attack authority. First Samuel fifteen twenty three. For rebellion is like the sin of divination. Whoa! Be careful how we deal with these things. The practice divination is the practice of seeing knowledge of the future or by an unknown supernatural means, especially by fortune telling, witchcraft, rebellion, divination, linked through manipulation. We have to be very careful. It says rebellion is like this. Why? Because rebellion ends up manipulating people. You can see the, the rebellion causes fear. There's fear in black people, there's fear in white people, there's fear in those who want to protest legally, fairly, and there's fear in the police. There's, there's this whole culture of fear, and so we don't get to the root of things. And arrogance, like the evil of idolatry, when people become arrogant, it's like idolatry. If I become arrogant, my attitude is, well, my opinion's better than yours and I'm better than yours. And what is that? It's like the sin of idolatry. Why? Because I've made an idol of myself. I've placed myself above you, which I'm above no man. And Jesus said he'd come to serve all men. Scripture says the greatest of you in the kingdom of God will be the lowest of you in the kingdom of this world. He never said I've come to be served. He said, I've come to serve. But we struggle to serve. We struggle 
to accept any authority over us because we think that says something about us, that weakens us. Do you know what? I don't care about the authority over me. Why? Because I know the, th the authority in me is Christ Jesus. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And you, if you don't know who you are, you will always struggle with these situations. You know? And we've all experienced uh, forms of abuse. I mean, I was in Africa a few years ago. I was racially abused while I was in Africa. I've been racially abused in uh, situations while I've been in the UK. Now, what I experienced was probably minor in comparison with some people whose, whose lives have been devastated by it. And it's so wrong. It's not right. I'm not saying it's right by any measure. But I'm saying let's be wise. Let's see the root of these things. For we don't fight against flesh and blood, but powers and principalities. So we've got to deal with the powers and the principalities behind the rebellion instead of just dealing with the flesh and blood that's on the street. And that's the problem. We're reacting to the flesh and blood on the street, and we're not reacting to the powers and principalities behind it that motivates it. And this is where we've got to become wise. We've got to grow up in the Lord. Hallelujah. Proverbs 17, verse 11. An evil man seeks only rebellion. Therefore, a cruel messenger will be sent to him. The evil men seek rebellion. The evil within them. Lawlessness is a disregard for authority in the world, the church and the home. It is to be unruly. So there the rules follow the rules. That's it. That simple. But do you know what? I watched, I watched this uh, programme where they get, uh, they get some children about five years old, I guess, and they put sweets on the table. And they say, right, this is, the teacher said, oh, I've got to go out the, the class. Now, there, there's sweets on that table, but don't touch them. You're not allowed to, to eat the sweets. Do you know what? 99% of these kids, they're looking at it, if this is the sweet, they're, they're, they're looking at the sweet. Looking at the door, looking at the sweet, looking at it. And, and they just can't help. And they end up opening the sweetie box, you know. And that is the same as when you're an adult. The same thing can happen. And we fall, why? Because we've born into a fallen world. You don't have to teach a child to do wrong, it will do it naturally. Normally the first word out of a child's mouth is mummy, daddy, no. You know? And you can see in society, children are becoming more and more rebellious, more and more rebellion against their parents and against authority, more and more disrespectful. When you see this end time anarchy spirit, rebellious, Antichrist spirit in society at large. A society without rules or laws is a society called anarchy, which is defined as a state of disorder. And God is a God of order. God is a God of order. He is a God of authority. And it says that God has placed in their position, those in government and leadership to bring about his will and purposes. And I tell you, the earth's going to get a lot worse for the end to come. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't fight against injustice and racism and abuse. We should. But no, it's going to get worse. Now, this is what happened after the leader of Israel uh, died, Joshua. Okay? Joshua died, and then lawlessness was revealed in the hearts of the men. Judges 17, verse 6. Judges 17, verse 6. In those days, Israel had no king, and everyone did as he saw fit. See, and that's the culture we live in. Well, it's my truth. It's not about the truth. No, it's my truth. Okay? And we are living in a lawless society where we, even in the church, are becoming demigods. We're becoming gods of ourselves. What I say goes. 
My emotions are correct emotions. My feelings to this are the correct feelings. You can't tell me how I should behave. I have freedom and liberty. I have the right to do X, Y, and Z. And we become lawless and gods to ourselves and we won't even obey the word of God because we supersede it. Who said that that was wrong? Why is it wrong? Why should I follow a God who decided murder is wrong? What if murder is not wrong? What if it's my choice? You know, it's a dangerous package. And we are not the creator, but yet we are the created by a heavenly father who loves us. This brought about in Israel a gradual disorder that led the country into chaos and eventual apostasy because they had no king and everybody saw fit to do as he thought. This brought complete disorder. The book of Judges points to the fact that Israel needed a godly king who would do what was right, not in his own eyes, but in the eyes of God. So it's not even down to what I think is right, it's down to what God says is right. There's your side, my side and God's side. You know, I've done many, many sessions in marriage support classes and, uh, you know, I always say to people, to the, to the husband, I'm not on your side. To the wife, I'm not on your side. I'm on God's side. I'm not taking sides. There are some things that we think we have an opinion on. And sometimes we've got to lay that opinion down and take God's opinion. My opinion is X, Y and Z. But the word of God says this. My opinion is I should retaliate and say something. And that, but God's opinion is this. God's opinion is that I, I should forgive. That's God's opinion. But I don't want to forgive. I want to say my bit. I want to fight my right. But see, when I accepted Jesus, I laid down my rights. Not to be abused, but I laid down my rights and I picked up his rights, his authority and his standard. Not mine. Start fighting for the kingdom of God and not just our own skin colour. Let's start fighting for the kingdom of God and we will find that there is justice because he is a God of justice. And we need justice for all, even uh, people who have done wrong. We need to find that. A godly leader will always choose God's side before the side of the people. See, when Moses went up and left Aaron, the people decided they wanted a golden calf. They wanted something to place their love and affection, their worship to. And Aaron agreed and he allowed them to make a golden calf. And they put all their focuses on that. But that was not just that was the problem. Look what it led to. They ended up getting completely naked and all sorts going on. So you open a door and the door might look, well, it's not too bad, but what does it lead to? And, uh, but Moses was a, a leader who would do what was right by God before he would please the people. Amen. Now there's a lot of leaders out there who are people pleasers, you know. Now, we've got to be people lovers, but not people pleasers. Now, Jesus was a people lover, but not a people pleaser. Okay? And if, if anyone was uh, socially uh, out of sync with his time, it was Jesus. Jesus never bowed the knee to political opinion. But he said, I bow the knee to the one who has sent me, which was the Father. Lawlessness is about self, being a law unto self. Lawlessness is the unwillingness to be ruled by anybody else. And that's a big one. We're all fighting to be at the top. The less people that are ruling above me, the more freedom I have. Yet Paul says, I am a prisoner to Christ Jesus. But we're all fighting to get to the top of the tree. Oh, we don't mind having people under us. We just don't want anybody over us. You see what I mean? It's a double standard. But Jesus said, I've come to lay my life down. I'm laying down my rights. I'm saying, Father, not my will, 
but your will. I'm laying down my own rights, Jesus said, and I'm picking up the right of God. Jesus was saying in the Garden of Gethsemane, Lord, if there's another way, if there's another way this can be achieved without the injustice that appears to be present, then Lord, take that way, but not my will, yours be done. And Jesus walked the road to Golgotha and laid his life down. And what appeared to be complete defeat and humiliation was the greatest victory the world will ever know. The whole of eternity will ever know. And yet it was born in what appeared to be defeat. Hallelujah. Oh, I love it. I love the kingdom of God. Now, there's legal lawlessness and there's illegal lawlessness. Legal lawlessness, which is legally in society uh, legally accepted behavior of actions in society but not in the eyes of God for example abortion is legal in society but not right by God divorce is legal in society but not right by God adultery is legal in society but not right by God uh, uh, sex before marriage all different types of things witchcraft same-sex marriages euthanasia there's lots of things that are lawless or, or legal in the terms of humanity but according to God these are not the best for humanity and then there's illegal lawlessness which is illegal in the eyes of the Lord but also in humanity for example murder rioting stealing rape okay now you've always got to remember God is not us and we are not him. And so we're not always going to equate his total righteousness, total sovereignty, total power, total love. And sometimes we can question his character when we say, Lord, why are you letting this happen? As if to say, God, you've got this wrong. Be careful. I say, Lord, I don't know why this is happening, but I'm trusting you in it. And I'm going to pray for the victory. And I'm praying for justice and righteousness to prevail. And I trust your sovereignty, Lord. Hard to do, lawlessness is the desire not to be under authority, it is, the, it is the cause of rebellion and disobedience, Ephesians 2 verse 1, Ephesians 2 verse 1, as for you, you were dead in your transition, uh, transgressions and your sin in which you used to live when you followed the way of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air. Satan, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. So now we're looking at, we see the manifestations, but what's the root? We saw the root coming in in the Garden of Eden, and we know it's Satan, this rebellious spirit. The Amplified says the sons of disobedience, the careless ones, the, the rebellious ones, the unbelieving, those who go against the purposes of God. Lawlessness is not just limited to society and the world we live in. Unfortunately, there is lawlessness in every society. Right across the world, there is lawlessness. Now, the ultimate authority is God. Therefore, any type of lawlessness or rebellion against God is anarchy. Why? Because he is the law giver. God. James 4 verse 12, James 4 verse 12. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you who judge your neighbour. Now he's questioning, he's saying there's only one lawgiver and judge. One. But we dare to judge our neighbour and judge this, that and the other. And, and, you know, it's because we think we've got a bad deal. Now imagine this, uh, a moth. A moth is an insect. It can fly, it can walk, it's got wings. They love light, they're attracted to the light and they buzz around. Well, see, there was a caterpillar who was fed up. Blimmin' cheesed off. Why have I been made a poxy caterpillar living in a cabbage field? Look at that moth. 
beautiful moth flying around, free to do what he wants. And God has made me a poxy caterpillar. It's not right. It's not fair. This is injustice. I want the freedom that that moth's got. Do you know what? I'd rather die than be stuck as a caterpillar crawling around on my belly. I've had enough. I'm going to bed. He wakes up the next morning. But overnight, a transformation has happened. He's moved from being a caterpillar to becoming a butterfly. And suddenly when he comes out in the morning, there's a moth sitting on the tree. And he looks at the, uh, looks at the butterfly and says, it's not fair. Look at that beautiful flipping butterfly. Why can't I be a butterfly? I would have been happy to be a caterpillar if I knew I was going to be a butterfly. You see, it's an endless cycle. But the wonderful joy is in heaven there'll be complete equality. It's wonderful. The first law was given by God to Adam in Genesis chapter 2 verse 16. Genesis chapter 2 verse 16. And the Lord commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. From when you eat of it, you will surely die. So the rule was put in place for protection and out of love. Because he said, when you eat from it, you will surely die. And the first law was put in place to bring protection. Rules are there generally to bring safety and protection. That's generally why rules are put in place. To protect society. I mean, I know everyone's different and we, we get concerns about all these cameras in our neighbourhoods watching all what's going on and some people don't like it and that's fine, they don't have to like it. For me, it doesn't bother me if it means they're going to catch somebody who's doing something wrong or stealing a car or breaking into a house. The fact that it shows me going to the shop and back every day doesn't bother me. I'm comfortable because I understand the purpose of the camera and I haven't got any issue about it. So the first law was given, Adam, you're free to eat from any tree in the garden, but don't eat from this one or you'll surely die. Now God didn't want robots, he gave us free will, and we have free will to do what's right or to do what's wrong. We have free will to love or to hate. We have free will to choose, and a lot of the time we choose the wrong thing, me included. Instead of choosing the right thing, sometimes we choose the wrong thing. Now, the origins of lawlessness are held within Satan. And the very first to rebel was Satan, Isaiah 14, verse 12. And in Ezekiel 28, 12, it details the rebellion against God when Satan, or Lucifer, he was known, decided he wanted to do his own thing. And Isaiah 14 says, How you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God and I will sit enthroned on the mount of the assembly, on the uttermost heights of Mount Zithron. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. But you are brought down to the realm of the dead and to the depths of the pit. See, God is a God of order. And there was order before there was humanity. So before God created humanity, he created order. He created rank and file and purpose and precision. And you've got the Trinity, which is a complete unity, but it's still got different purpose and precision. Then God created the archangels, the seraphim angels, the cherubim angels, which are different ranks and order because they have different positions. Some are warring angels, some are messenger angels, but they have different ranks and position within the angelic realm. And so there was order and rank and different position before man was even created. There's the order and uh, even in creation, okay? And scientists are discovering 
how God used different elements in creation and figures and numbers to bring it about. They're all, all they're doing is discovering how God did it. They're not creating it. They're not doing it. They just say, oh, God used this method to do it. Okay, but there has always been rank and order. And the problem is Ezekiel 28. And this talks of the way Satan moved. And this is what the Sovereign Lord said. You were the, talking of Satan. You were the seal of perfection. Perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Wow. Every beautiful stone was in Lucifer. Lucifer was an archangel, a beautiful angel. It describes his body as having onyx and topaz and emeralds and turquoise and beryls and all these beautiful uh, precious stones. His mountains were made of gold. They were created, prepared for him. He was anointed as a guardian cherubim angel. God ordained it so. And he walked amongst the fiery stones. The very presence of God. What privilege he had. You were blameless in all your ways from the day you were created until wickedness was found in you. Through your widespread trade you were filled with violence and you sinned. And I drove you out in disgrace from the mount of God and expelled you, guardian cherub, from the fiery stones. Your heart became proud on account of your beauty and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendour. Wow. So God created Lucifer as a, as a beautiful cherubim angel to be in the very presence of God. But in Lucifer's heart and his mind, he decided this was not enough. I want equality with God. And for those who want equality, often it rises up further. But in actual fact, he didn't want equality with God. He wanted to be higher than God. I want to ascend above the clouds of God. Wow. See, equality was no longer good enough. I want to be better than. And it says it corrupted his wisdom on account of his beauty. He was wise, but this selfishness got in him. I want to be greater than God. I want all that worship for me. My right, I deserve, I want. He forgot he was created. And he had a beautiful purpose in the throne room of God. And Lucifer, this cherubim angel, became Satan and the devil the rebellious and the lawless one who tried to pollute all that God has instituted, including humanity. Then rebellion was suddenly found in Adam and he disobeyed God. And then rebellion was found in Adam's children. And all of society ever since have been born with sin, infused that sin, carnal parasite has taken a latch and a hold into humanity but because of Jesus he says I can set you free because I'm building a new kingdom and of my kingdom and of my justice there will be no end hallelujah there will be no tears there will be no inequality there will be no black there will be no white there will be no green there will be no yellow Wow, what it, would it be? We'd just be beautiful with complete unity and that parasite of sin will not have dominion over us. We will not no longer feel downtrodden. Oh, hallelujah. See, we can get so mixed up and so confused. Years ago, I had somebody say to me as I was leading a church one time, you haven't got any black representation on your leadership. And I was a very young pastor. I'd only just come up into the job. And uh, there weren't that many black people in comparison with white people in the church. And this person approached me and said, you have not got black representation on your leadership. And I looked them in the eye. I said, I will never have black representation on church leadership. And this woman was horrified. She looked at me in shock. And I said, if I have black representation in my church leadership surely I will be picking that person on the basis of the colour of their skin
skin to represent people of the same skin colour, whatever that colour might be. But the Bible says, pick men, women, men, mankind, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. Now, if I'm going to pick you just on the basis of your skin, I am discrediting your wisdom and everything else that you have. We, the church, is to rep represent Jesus to the world, not us represent people groups to God. But for us to represent Jesus to the world, the world will know me through your love for one another. And I said, you see, I can't, I don't want to pick you on the basis of your skin. If I was in a country where I was the minority, I don't want somebody to say, let's pick Matthew, because he can re re uh, represent these pale-skinned people. I would be gutted. You're picking me because of the colour of my skin. I want you to pick me because I'm a man of God who loves Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit is within me and I'm displaying wisdom and I'm displaying the fruit of the Spirit. That's the qualification that I want. I don't want you to pick me to represent the colour of my skin. I want you to pick me because I represent Jesus. Do you understand what I'm saying? Now, yes, in some organisations there, there needs to be representation, I get that, but I'm talking about the kingdom. And so the wonderful joy was I ended up with more, uh, at that time, more black people on my leadership than white people by a country mile. But it wasn't because they were black, it's because they were wise and they were full of the Holy Spirit. And even today, I have black people on my leadership team, but not because they're black. I have them because of who they are in God. They just happen to be black or they happen to be white. I value people beyond their skin colour. But we should never be racist. We should not be down on people because of their skin and we shouldn't cancel people out because of their skin colour or orientation in any kind of way. That is wrong. It's not right. And we've got, we've got to see these things addressed in society, but with wisdom, not with rioting, looting and lawlessness, but with love, intellect and wisdom. Our God is not a God of chaos, but he is a God of order. And he creates order in the home, order in the community, order in the country, order in government, order in church and order in heaven, etc. Hebrews 2 verse 6. What is man that you are mindful of him? The son of man that you care for him. For you have made him little, uh, little lower than angels. And you have crowned him with glory and honour. And you have put everything under his feet. Wow! What respect God has for his creation of humanity, irrespective of colour, for every person, from the oldest to the eldest, from the fattest to the thinnest, he loves us and he has given us a crown and honour. Ephesians 6 verse 12, Ephesians 6 verse 12, says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. That's what our struggle is against. Hallelujah. That's the struggle. And Christian brothers and sisters, we need to come together. And we need to support one another. And we need to be one family. And we need to break down these cultural-based churches that are just a, a Jamaican or West African orientation or, or a Caribbean orientation or Sierra Leone orientation, or this, that and the other. When we get to heaven, we're just all going to be in the boat together. And that's it. Now, I understand there are people groups in society. If I lived in America and I met someone who's English, I'd be thrilled to bits because they'll understand my thinking and my background and my history. And so when we come together, it's perfectly normal to celebrate and to have friendships with people who have come from our own 
uh, backgrounds. That's normal. It's great. Celebrate that from wherever you are. Come together. But remember we're the kingdom of God. No matter our background. And it's his kingdom first. His kingdom, his power, his authority. Revelation 5 verse 9 says, and this is uh, the Apostle Paul on the Isle of Patmos and he's peering into heaven and he's seeing what's going on. And it says, and they sung a new song to Jesus. They sung a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll, to open its seal, for you were slain and you have redeemed us to be to God by the power of your blood out of every tribe and every tongue and people and nation and you have made us kings and priests to serve our God and we shall reign on the earth. Hallelujah. And it says, and I looked and I heard the voice of many angels surrounding the throne and the living creatures and the elders and they numbered them 10,000 times 10,000 saying with a loud voice worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honour and glory and blessing and every creature that was in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and in the sea and all what was in them I heard saying blessing and honour and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb for ever and ever and ever and ever. Oh, what wonder, what glory, what unity. My friends, let's look beyond. Let's have spiritual insight. Our fight is not against flesh and blood but against powers and principalities. And the more and more we can stand together in unity from every nation and every creed and every language and every background, the more we can stamp out injustice and racism and judging people depending on how much they earn and the colour of their skin and how many exams they got and qualifications and so on and so forth. It's like like I preached last week on judging. Can you see how the enemy gets in? My brothers and sisters, let's hold out the right hand of fellowship. Amen? Let's not be like those who say, oh, who will I be in the kingdom of heaven? I want to be the greatest. Jesus says, well, if you want to be the greatest, be willing to be the servant of all. Hallelujah. I pray that you're blessed. I pray that you're encouraged. Know who you are in Christ Jesus. Know what the word says against you. When the enemy comes in with his lies, his accusations, which might come out of the mouth of teenagers or of old men or out of the mouth of white people or Chinese or black or Asian, do you know what? Let it go over your head. Don't let it. Know who you are in Christ Jesus. Know who you are. Who does the word of God say you are? That's who you are. And it says that you have been accepted into God's family. You are not here by the will of a husband or the desire of man, but you are here by the will of God. That's how you have been birthed. And if God wants to elevate you to be a prime minister, if he wants to elevate you to be the top surgeon, elevate you to be the greatest lawyer, wonderful, we celebrate that. But if God wants to elevate you to be a dustman, elevate you to be a road sweeper, elevate you to be a, a, a fruit picker, whatever it is, do you know what? It's the same in Christ Jesus. We just have different purpose. Fulfill your purpose in Jesus' name. Let's bring unity to the body. Let's break down the dividing wards. Amen. Let's be real. Let's leave our monuments alone. Let's honour God. God bless your heart. Take care. Be encouraged. We live in perilous times, but Jesus Christ is Lord. God bless you.